52. The Jerry Ryan Show, Monday to Friday, 9 till 12 on 2FM. This weekend we're back. Six nations, 15 green shirts, one face like a slapped arse. Mine. What would rugby be like without the hooky monster? And Poopy. Shut your kiwi cake hole, Poopy. What? Without me, the rugby would be as boring as a Jacqueline Kidney press conference. Hang on then. Okay. In Poopy. Go home and watch Skippy. It's yo. Australian, Georgia, New Zealand. Now you're all the same. Yeah. The Six Nations starts this Saturday against ah. France with commentary by Ryle Nugent. You shut up too. Oh my God, you great beanstalk. It's a rook. It's a rook. I'm a rook off Nugent. <laughs> the Labour Party needs you. That's right. I'm Eamon Crappy Gilmore, here to tell you that we're recruiting right now. Don't you wish your leader could bluff like me? Join us today and become an aggressive campaigner overnight, just like our fearsome John Burton. Somebody think of the children! Feel her clanging voice rattle in your gonads. Ooh. But how about becoming a visionary like Labour's poet Michael Tree Higgins? Oh, proud era with your emerald buttocks glistening blue from the economic kick in the asshole. That's right. <laughs> Don't get left behind. No. Get behind the left and you'll be yes, on uh, the, ra- the right what? side. What? That's confusing, I know, but imagine how confusing it would be if we had any policies or plans and things. <laughs> <laughs> so go on. Go into labour. Go into labour. Oh, bucks and breast of air. That's enough, Michael. What? How dare Sick you? Sick and tired of your stupid Insulting my poetry. Rubbish that you have. You're no past rubbish, Gilmore. What? No, you have no right to be. Don't get out of my house. How dare you? Jeeva Karja Mihal Anshah. In a small room in a modest hotel in Torles, 1884, a group of men came together and created one of the great organisations in history. Next door to that meeting, another group got stociously drunk, busted the head off each other with sticks and created the GAA. For 125 years, it has made legends out of assholes and assholes out of legends. For 125 years, it's credited with the invention of the hang sandwich, the baby oil comb over, and ladies' football, the single biggest lesbian institution in Europe. Up. The GAA. Sport broadens the mind, so be careful of that. The GAA. Keeping pioneers, misers, and backward Kenny men occupied since 1884. <laughs> this is Brad Lennon here on behalf of Ireland. Right now we've got a vacancy for a financial regulator to undersee our banking system. The ideal job if you've plenty of experience of growth and competence, like force, or maybe you're recently in charge of Zimbabwe's national debt. Successful applicants must be highly skilled at perhaps you worked on an ostrich farm or Nazi Germany. You'd be ideal for a job that requires you to hear nothing, see nothing, and say nothing. And as we always say in the financial regulator, Irish are everything's grand. 500 grand a year plus bonuses, that is. Apply today. And remember, hiring and firing of the financial regulator is regulated by the financial regulator. Terms and conditions apply, but don't mind them neither. <laughs> Illuminating, and you can hear that again and your other favourites uh, because all of Knob Nation and the classics are available by going to rt.ie, look out for the podcast, the downloads, or if you've got iTunes, download it on your laptop, your iPod, your whatever. A Bond girl, an Avenger, she's played a cocaine-snorting, champagne-swilling alcoholic, and we loved her for it. And in recent years, she's worked as a successful campaigner for human and indeed even animal rights. Some would say, what's the difference? She's in Ireland to celebrate the launch of Nivea Visage Expert Lift. And she joins us now in the studio. Joanna Lumley, good morning and welcome. Hello, Jerry. What do you think I look like? I think you look extremely well. This is due to Nivea Visage Expert Lift. 
You, <laughs> that is. How's the, that for an advertisement? That's the just most in. gracious and indeed borderline unbelievable plug I've ever come across. <laughs> and I would say that your sponsors and uh, those fine people in Nivea will be absolutely delighted with it. Look, I don't know whether it's Nivea or whether it's good genes or whether you did a deal with the voodoo princess, but you do look extremely well. I'm very pleased. Thank you. And thank God for it. Thank How do you think I look? My eyes are a bit odd I think at the you're moment. looking hellish attractive. My God. I think this is going to go very well. Hmm. <laughs> More coffee. <laughs> now, let's get this whole commercial thing out of our hair yeah. immediately. What is this, what is this elixir that you're it's, peddling, well, look, madam? The truth is, is that I've been using Nivea since I was about 14. It's the kind of cream we took with us to school because it was cheap and it was reliable. It was wholesome. Thank you so much. On just all of your body. Small brandy and soda. Thank you. Thank you very it. much. Um, and you, put, you could use it all over your body. You could yeah. use it on your spotty little teenage face. But it was... It was within price because it was quite cheap. It was extremely reliable. It was trustworthy. It was safe, and it was. My mum used to slap it on us when we were off on sun holidays. That's I right, remember. sun. Very good for yeah, sun. Very yeah. good for dryness. I mean, just great in every way. But mm. now they've refined it more and more, and have got grander and grander things for older and older people. That clattering is not my bones. It's actually some buttons I've got. I see here it says it, it offers instant and long-term effect for the fifty-plus woman. You see, that's me. Just, just over fifty. Yeah, I'm with you there. Oh. I'll soon be over <laughs> for myself, actually. <clears throat> uh, and so maybe it's I should just get 20 <laughs> jars of it immediately. <laughs> just get it on now. <laughs> but anyway, they've got good stuff, which kind of makes your... God knows how it happens. It kind of makes your skin less ancient, dry, papery, wrinkly and more mm. pluffed up and pl- plumed and bloomed. Does it have that hemorrhoid sort of stuff in it? You know, Can we not say these words? It's well, no, because I was doing some television recently and the very, very attractive girl that does the makeup, who's a former playmate. Do you know that, Deirdre? Um, she, imagine having your makeup done by a former playmate. I think it's a good idea anyway. Um, she was putting this stuff on my uh, under my eyes mm. and she said, this is absolute genius because it's got hemorrhoid cream in it, mixed in with it. It makes absolute sense because and it shrinks you. Yeah, That's why your head today is much, much smaller than your shoulders. That's true. <laughs> in fact, if you could actually see me at the moment, it's frightening. I have an infant's head on a 52-year-old <laughs> man's body. I think I could get a job with Mr. Bites in his circus. Um, but it does seem to be doing something to you. Or is it really? I mean, is it not? Are you just not beautiful well, I've put by on, virtue of oh, look, I've God's makeup, grace? I smile a lot. Um, yeah. Your eyesight isn't terribly good. We're in a dimly lit studio. But I am wearing glasses, though. You're wearing glasses. No, you are. So tell me, the what's the is, science? What's the science, madam? I don't know the science because I've never understood it and I've never understood the ingredients properly because some of the acids and things that they put in... Acid sounds awful. I didn't mean acid. But it's, it's called some name which I can never pronounce. Hyrulant nano. I'm talking about slow. Which, it, but they add these new things in which just sort of plink, plonk, plink. Quite a lot of them are natural things that come out of plant stuff. And it, they're, just, they're just good for your skin. Just put it on and stop talking about it. Mm. Buy it, put it on, be quiet, and just wait to receive the confluence. Confluence come in shed loads, you know. Now, and how old are you? May I ask that incredibly indelicate? 82, 82 next birthday. <laughs> you see, so it does work. Can you just believe it? Bloody this? amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Well, that's great. Is that enough about the Nivea <laughs> stuff, is it? Okay, that's fantastic. Now... Forever and ever, not unlike Pauline McGlynn, who played Mrs. Doyle, mm. slightly less glamorous role um, uh, than your absolutely fabulous role. She is, she's a mixture. She's a love hate. Pauline has a love hate relationship with her father Ted character. Yeah. Um, she realizes quite obviously because she's a smart woman, um, appearing in Fiona Looney's October in the Olympia Theatre soon. She realises that it was the break of a lifetime. Uh, uh, she also realises that wherever she goes, whatever she does, yeah. forever and ever, amen, she will be Mrs. Doyle. Yeah. Um, you, forever and ever, amen, will be Patsy. Unless you are of the older persuasion to a lot of people, I'm still Purdy. I'm still Purdy. Oh, I used oh. to have vile thoughts about Did you? Purdy, yes. Did you? But Did so you? you've vanquished those and have gone straight for the Patsy, the older woman, the crumbling older woman, to suit your image now. Is that what we're talking no, about? No, I think um, uh, I think both of them, you wouldn't rush any of them away, really, to be honest. 
There was I, good fun. You know, Patsy, I think because she made people laugh, I think because it came at a time when it was the whole show was so shocking. Mostly shows which had families in them ended up with people saying, well, that's all right, dear, I forgive you. At I the wonder end. would you get away with it now? I, know, I don't know. Well, yes, they're going to. You know, Jennifer's out in America at the moment with the exact scripts we did advising the American cast who are going to be doing it. An American cast. There's an American Oh, like Patsy. the way they've done The Office. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing is that what uh, I'd be, inter- be interested to see it now because we're so politically correct now. We were able to... Now, obviously, deep cocaine addiction is a yeah. tragic thing. <laughs> and um, and <laughs> ladies do seem to co- succumb to it to a much greater degree than men do. Um, but we were able to laugh our socks okay. off at Patsy smoking her head off, never yep. eating, borderline anorexic, yep. and uh, sniffing drinking away. Like fish. And drinking like fish. Injecting we were able to Botox laugh at her. When it. she sat down, she just didn't put a needle into her forehead whenever she felt like it to get the Botox in. I mean, <laughs> bad behaviour. But this couldn't be done now. You're quite Did right. you love her? Oh, I loved her. And mm. we used to think of all sorts of more things to do with her all the time. I like the idea very much that she had once been a man. She had a go at being a man. So she went to Morocco and had something stitched on and took hormones, grew a small moustache. After a year, it all withered away and fell off. So she stopped the hormones, came back and became kind of a kind of woman again, kind of. But she'd had most of her in, internal organs removed because they'd all, frankly, rotted away. Uh, I, I'm, I'm beginning to find her less attractive well, now, actually. <laughs> she was never attractive, you <laughs> sick man. She was but I was character. attracted to her. I just felt you could do... It. I know this is a sin to say this, but I felt you could do really rude things to her. You know, stuff that you couldn't even, you know, for instance, if you said it to your girlfriend or your wife, she'd go, ah, oh, I'm calling the police and a, and a protection agency. Whereas you felt a patsy go, whatever. She would, and she would, and she did. She loved it. She liked it. She liked it once she woke up under Keith Richards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but you point. are right. There is an entirely different generation who will remember. And I remember it was quite controversial when Purdy appeared in The Avengers because um, this was the role, of course, that um, Honor Blackman had uh, yeah. immortalised. And Diana Rigg. And Diana Rigg. And um, we all had a lot of ideas about exactly how Steed should be played and indeed how any of the sidekicks should be played. We were also living in an era where feminism was beginning to um, rear its beautiful head. Mm. And uh, so it must have been quite a challenge for you to play a woman that was both sexy, strong, credible, without being my beautiful assistant. Yes, and also I didn't. I had, when I got the part, I had sort of shoulder-length hair. And I said I wanted to cut it off into a no-nonsense bob because I had this idea that Purdy would be quite a kind of busy little policewoman, kind of rather swatty little human. I wouldn't have time for... Would not want to have time, wouldn't want to be decking her hair. I didn't want to look frilly or pretty. And uh, I slightly got across the producers who said, no, nobody's ever had a heroine with short hair. So they made me sign a contract which said that if the hair thing didn't work, I would have to wear a wig, which I would have to pay for. (laughs) So I signed that. But luckily the hair thing did work. It came at just the right time because all the girls then had long hair. And the hairdressers all said, why don't you try this? All the girls went in and said, can I have a purdy bob? Hairdressing was back on its feet. Yeah. Um, the, you know, I saved, frankly, the beauty industry. Well, you know what I mean. Well, hairdressers anyway. Anyway, people like John Frieda, who'd cut it for me, who was a junior at the hair salon he worked at, became more and more famous. And now is John Frieda of John Frieda-dom. Obviously, you, you you obviously use this hair product. I, I do. Look at my hair. Isn't my hair amazing? It's look, look. It is gorgeous. Do you want to feel it? N- n- no. Okay. No, no. Um, there, a number of old ladies came up to me a couple of months ago. Dear, I told you about this, didn't I? And I was in the supermarket. I must have looked lonely. <laughs> and um, they came up to me and they were saying, Hello, do you know what to, what you're looking for? And I said, Yes, yes, ladies, I do. Thank you. And they went, Isn't this hair lovely? And then they started pulling it. <laughs> and so I was standing and I just thought to myself, my goodness, university, a Presbyterian father, and it's come to this. <laughs> I'm having my hair pulled by elderly ladies in a supermarket. But it is amazing. I used to have a ponytail when I was a much younger man. Mm. And that was the only thing that people ever talked about. When they, So I could have done Gone with the Wind yes. and they would have said Jerry's ponytail looked stupid. Um, your haircut uh. became an iconic thing. Yeah, wasn't it? It was an industrial thing. Yes. It, it became, it was compulsory in Holland. Everybody in Holland had to have it. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, in South Africa they had it. Wherever the show went, it it became, 
And it had was slightly interpreted differently. So it went from what I thought was quite a cute little heavy fringe with cropped in mm. like, like sort of a schoolboy haircut. Gradually it went through page, sad page boy, into pancake landing on head look. So it kind of got worse and worse and worse. Not with me, not with me. I tried to keep mine. But anyway, it kind of went round like The this. versions of it. And I sometimes had to judge pa- um, Purdy lookalike competitions. And some of the people wearing the Purdy cut were grannies. And some were 12-year-olds. So it was put on virtually everybody. And then... You also, if I recall, and please forgive me for having such um, a powerful recall of some of this detail. Um, you... Uh, she had a slit skirt and she had a gun and a garter, if I recall, and stockings. She did. Didn't she? Yeah. The story Which, of that was that I actually... I believe that all this, members of the security this, forces this was should the, have to wear these. No, but sides. Jerry, look, but just listen to me for a quiet moment. This was the launch of it when they, when they were announcing me as the person who was going to be playing the new character. Mm. And we had it outside the Dorchester Hotel. The world's press had massed up. They closed Park Lane of busy, busy traffic so that everybody could jostle around to take the pictures of the new girl. And I got there and I was wearing some sort of flimsy outfit and sleekly dressed as most of the women listeners, all women listeners know that you want to do want a visible panty line or anything, blotchy or gloggy. So I had a pair of sleek tights on. And no knickers. And the press said, no, I had knickers on, you madman. Oh, well, um, But I had the tights on. And the press said, if you do not wear stockings and suspenders, we will boycott the whole event. You're I said, joking. I haven't got them. I haven't got them. So I raced back with the press officer into the Dorchester Hotel. We went down to the women's lavatory where there was an older person, an old woman, a woman minding her own business who'd had a pleasant morning's shopping. We wrestled her to the ground and said, are you wearing stockings? She was. She was much shorter than me. We took off her suspender belt. We took off her stockings. They weren't even matching. Her legs were much shorter than mine. So one stocking came just above the knee. The I other stocking which got that. a bit higher up. I stuck the gun in. I went outside. The press was still there. They took the pictures. I signed them to this day, 40 years on. Well, 30 years on. Mm. And the woman, we left her bruised and bleeding. Quite right. She served her country. <laughs> we gave her she 10 be, quid and the tights are taken off. <laughs> she should be glad. She, what was Patrick like who played oh, Steve? He's so lovely. He's he's the old man now and he lives in Palm Springs where he's lived for the last 30 or 40 years. He was completely lovely and he used to he used to think that he acted Steed, but he actually was Steed. No, he because, you know, I recall watching him being interviewed and I could see absolutely no, no difference, difference whatsoever. He hated guns, so he would never carry a gun. Oh, so he's like around. Daniel Craig. Oh, what? Doesn't he wear? Daniel doesn't like guns, but of course, he obviously, has Bond to. has to have a gun. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to give him? A tennis racket? It's ridiculous. <laughs> but Steed didn't like guns. He had the cane, though, which did he things, He had the though. Um, umbrella. Yeah. Of which he would poke people with sometimes. And then Ga- Gambit and I, my mm. sidekick, be- late beloved Gambit, Gareth Hunt, we were pretty nifty at firing guns and kicking people. I kicked people a lot and sometimes punched them. And you used to do a nifty line in one pieces as well. Kicking seemed to have you in one piece. It was called the green slime. It was the first yeah. one. I said, I don't ever want to wear that again. It was a knitted one, all yeah. in one costume. See, I can remember all of this. And I thought this was when Hitler was on ice in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> cryogenically preserved <laughs> by a team of monks <laughs> now um, I don't know would they get away with doing that now I presume they're, they've thought of it I mean have they I wonder, well, they they tried to bring back the Avengers didn't they they made a film of it with yeah. Uma Thurman and I think Rafe Fiennes it was remember? crap I never saw it no, no, it's, and Rafe is it. such a wonderful actor they're both wonderful Yeah, but I don't think it, it, you see the Avengers itself was a sort of spoof in a way so you can't spoof a spoof and also it was of its time. Don't go back. Try to remember the old things. Don't go and do them again. Have you noticed a lot of films are being remade? Well, I think remaking something is incredibly dangerous. I mean, only ask Colin Farrell, Miami Vice. You, that was a doomed project yes, from the start. but he served himself with In Bruges. Have you seen In Bruges? Oh, splendid. That'll do. I still don't think that phone booth is not only Colin Farrell's best performance, but one of the greatest cinema performances I've ever come across. He's a miraculous and people actor. say, well, what do you mean by that? I go, look, hold on a second. This is one man, yeah. a script, a camera, and a phone booth. And you are absolutely riveted, riveted. to it. You can't take your eyes off it. No. no, he's completely, I think he's inspired. Good, brilliant boy. Yeah, You like him, obviously, yes. 
good. Okay, we're going to take a break. If anybody would like to join us this morning on 18... I'm beginning to feel a bit better now. I still have a stiff neck, though, and I'm deeply suspicious it could be something serious. Joanna Lumley's in studio this morning. Um, she is in Ireland to celebrate the launch of Nivea Visage Expert Lift. And that's not a very bright professor who um, has something that he's lifting up frequently. It's, in fact, um, a wonderful potion that makes you look younger. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Uh, it, we don't know, neither of us know what's in it, which no. is probably a, a trade <laughs> secret. Um, but it does work. I'm still kind of erring on the side that she just looks wonderful anyway. Um, but maybe she looks even more wonderful as a result of this fantastic product. I think product. the truth is, Jerry, if I hadn't used it, compliments would not be flying across this desk. No, they wouldn't. No. 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 Can you? Well, I hope they put that on the box then. <laughs> Jerry Ryan thought she looked great because of this stuff. That'll, that'll <laughs> sell it. Um, you're off to Dunn's in Cornell's Court. I, I know, believe. isn't it lovely? Off, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be there at 12.30. I'm going to be signing, meeting, greeting, probably kissing, possibly going further. Yeah. So well, I had a very interesting uh, meet and greet recently. This may happen to you today. What so did you do? Tell me. I was signing a book, a book that I wrote with the real Jerry Ryan, Please Stand Up, still available, um, I believe, in bargain basements. Um, and this woman came up, again an elderly lady, <laughs> and she licked my face. No, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who'd like to lick Joanna today, please, Dunn Stores, Cornell's <laughs> Court, 12.30. It's an Irish thing. It's a sign of affection. The Eskimos rub noses. The Irish lick your face. <laughs> now, of course, you have indeed spread your wings, and not just even in recent years, but in, in for a long, long time. You have expressed not just an interest, but you've become actively involved in human rights and indeed in animal rights. Um, I said... Not facetiously, in fact, what's the difference? I think you have to have a big heart for all of these things. I do, I don't see And what compelled you to speak out? Um, I think, tr I don't like bullying of any kind or cruelty of any kind. And so it's nice to be able to stand up for creatures, people or children or races or animals which can't sp speak up for themselves. Give their voice, you know, a bit of a boost if you can. So I work quite a lot for Compassion and World Farming, which is just better treatment for farm animals, the way we um, prepare them for the table, you know? You know, I was reading, um, what's his name, Herman something or other. He did a series with the BBC, but and he just has 10 dishes, the 10 most fantastic things ever. Mm. And in his introduction to the chicken mm. dish, he talks about uh, animal husbandry and how awful it is in relation to poultry. And I couldn't believe it. Broiler chickens, for the few weeks that they actually exist on Earth, their space is an A4 it's that. page. They can't. They're on their knees, literally. I know. Due to the overweight of their body and the incapacity of their legs. And I must admit, by the time I was finished reading this, I found it a bit difficult to read the recipe then afterwards. Yes. Well, the thing is, if you're going to eat anything, try to... Uh, Try to treat meat as a luxury. I think that's one of the things which we've forgotten since about halfway through the last century. Um, we all thought that we all should be eating meat lots of times. Maybe we should eat it twice a week instead of maybe three times a day, you know. So if you if you eat less meat, you then can spend more on the meat, which means that you can get better meat. You can get organic meat, stuff that's been grown outside. Chickens who can flap their wings and roost and, you know, rootle in the dust. And at the end of it, you get a much nicer piece of meat. I'm a vegetarian, so I'm just talking out of my hat here, but you understand what I'm saying. I do and understand what you're saying. have an outside, you know, curious. How long have you been a vegetarian? More years almost than you've been alive, boy. Really? And what can you recall? For instance, I'm evil, right? So <laughs> I try and make up for that by associating myself with various things like the ISPCC or UNICEF or you know, uh, ladies against fur coats or whatever. Um, but essentially I'm bad, right? Um, and I'm, I've worked very hard on it. I've just never been able to overcome it. Um, so therefore, being a vegetarian, I really envied anybody who became a vegetarian. And sometimes I would go, I am a vegetarian. And then I would go, no, I'm not. I'm eating that fillet steak immediately. That's fine. That's fine. Just make sure it's... Can you recall... Sourced. As a child, when obviously this I took wasn't, place. <laughs> <laughs> just before birth, when I became a vegetarian. Um, I was about 20-something. No, no, I was about 19. And so it obviously was a little bit more than 30 years ago. But um, I was about 19 and I was a model. And 
you always had to be slim as a model. And one of the diets was, I remember, ste- sort of steak and grapefruit. That's, what, that's all you could eat pretty much for sort of weeks on end. A, it was expensive and made you constipated. And B, when I was cutting through a piece of steak, a piece of rare steak, it suddenly l- looked as though it could have been my arm. And Ooh. for some reason, don't you know, it might have been my arm, actually, in those days. But the truth is, it just made me think I'd never really connected meat that you buy in supermarkets with actual, actual animals, you know? Mm. And if we bought the meat, if with still the fur on or the face on, we might all think a little bit differently about it. So I just began to think about it, and I started thought, do you know, I think I can exist without having to eat something which has been killed specially for me. And I now don't eat anything that's been killed, so that seems fine. Well, we used to have a fellow on this programme and he wouldn't eat anything with a face. That's fair enough. Um, or a pulse, that's the a other pulse. thing. Face pulse. But then people say, I was say, about oh, to say well, I'd never carrots, eat anything you know? furry, but that's not true. Um, uh, so, can you remember the last time you ate meat? Can you remember what it tastes like? Yes, I can. And sometimes, because people, I, I believe in getting on with people too. So, if people who who don't know me but love me dearly and want to make something very special, have have done something special for you, they will might, you eat it? They might. Of course, I will. Of course, I well, will. Well, bravo. Do you know something? Do you know what you're doing here? You are reminding us of something that has been taken away from us as a human race. Manners. Mm. I was up in far away, far away Hunza, which is right at the north of Pakistan. Sounds very far away. It's far away. And not only was that far away, I then went on a walk with just five, six men the way I am, through a place, to a prison thing called the Sh- Prison Valley of Shimshal. It was beyond, oh, yeah. beyond far away. Yeah. And there they were so pleased to see what our guide was a local prince. They were so pleased to see somebody from the royal family who hadn't been there for five years or something, that they, as they say, cut a goat. And cutting a goat means to slaughter a goat. And then this poverty-stricken valley, wherever we went, bits of the goat were served up because we were respected, honoured guests. Mm-hmm. And so I sat down and ate every piece that was offered to, offer to me because this was the finest offering they could make. Goat is nice, actually. Well, it, it, it was fine, but all yeah. they really needed was for you to receive that yeah. great honour. And could you imagine if, like, some crusty tree hugger you had said, no, I'm not, I couldn't possibly eat the goat. They would have remembered that forever. And it would have insulted them so yeah. much. No, well, and well also done. that goat had a good open-air life. I mean, the truth is, I really hate factory farming. That's what I really hate most mm. of all. More than the actual idea. Because, I mean, we're kind we're, of born to eat we're meat, sort of, We're sort of omnivores. We? I just think we eat a bit too omni. I think we vore a bit too of the omni. <laughs> I think we eat too much meat. I think we eat, Jerry. You must listen to me. Well, let's be honest. Stop, we, looking, we, stop we, looking up Deirdre's skirt. Like I, look, I look outside in the hopes that one of the girls will jump up <laughs> on the table. Um, for valediction, that's uh, the only... Uh, when I look outside, they go, yes, you're great. That's the, <laughs> they even have a sign that they sometimes put up. <laughs> but look, just very, very quickly, sum this up, then we won't go on with it. If, you, if we ate less meat, less land would be given over to fattening up animals, which then have to be turned into protein for only the rich part of the world to eat. Let's put more of it down to cereal crops and crops and things like this. And trees, which will save the planet. Grow trees, grow crops, keep smiling, eat less meat. Well, of course, you English cut down all our trees. I am largely Scottish. Okay, well, you're off the hook then. Thank you. Why does Scotland come into my mind now that we're talking about animals for a second? No, no, no. no. In fact, my um, paternal grandmother came from Scotland, so there's some Scottish blood floating through my veins. Um, Oh, yes, we had a... An initiative on the programme recently was Adopt a Dog in mm-hmm. conjunction with the ISPCA. And one of the statistics we were peddling to talk, enthuse people about helping out here was that um, in Scotland, in Ireland... Two years ago, we put down something like 12,000 dogs. In Scotland, with a comparable population and the same number of dogs, and obviously the same sort of problems regarding strays and dogs that are unwanted, they only put down 300 and something. So, so what, they'd our, rehomed them? Yeah, So our, and their, their neutering programme and everything yeah. had worked really, really well. So our, our shame was that comparison, you know. Yeah, yeah. They put, millions of dogs are put so down. Well, the Scots may be very mean. They... They are indeed on the money when it comes to taking care of animals. Yes. <laughs> it's a strange extrapolation. Quite a long journey, that one. <laughs> Stick on your headphones there if that's humanly possible. All right. Um, and Dave is on the line. Dave, good morning. Can you hear? 
I can. Jerry, how are testing, you? Testing, testing. I can hear Dave. Um, Dave, I'm very well. Well, no, that's an Irish thing, isn't it? I'm not. If, if an Irishman has his legs sawn off, he says he's very well. Um, now you have a story for us. Uh, just a brief one, Jerry. Uh, first of all, hi Joanna, how are you? Hi Dave. Um, I, I think Jerry, we're, we're saying I'm sure a lot of people would agree. If you, if you looked up in a picture dictionary, Joanna, uh, the, the word lady, you'll find it probably a picture of Joanna Lumley because I think she personifies it. You know, but, how uh, charming. Yep. Yes, the, the story is. goes back, Jerry. I can remember the date because it was the day of my wife's death, to 30th of January, 1982. The day of your wife's death. Debs. Oh, sorry, Jerry. Debs. Debs ball. So. Um, I, uh, I'd been in town collecting the suit and the, and the uh, corsage and that. And in the Ilac Centre, which was very new then, where I think where Dunn's was, it was just a big shell. There was a bit of a car stand. But up on a stage was Joanna, I think with Mike Murphy and Terry Wogan, just doing a, doing a little piece. It was a very good uh, chat, like a, a live chat show in the area there. And Joanna was very kind to, to stick around and sign autographs afterwards. And she signed one for me. But of course, she signed a purdy because that's all she was known as back then to everyone watching the new Avengers. Oh, gosh. And, and do you still have I that? I, I'm sure I, I could probably dig it out somewhere in Don't the attic. Don't put Dave on the really spot like that, Jerry. That's an awful thing to say. No, to but I'm just wondering, is this no, a complaint? Or? No, it is not. Because no, I just, It's not the kindest problem. thing, because I remember that so well. And I flew back with, with Terry on the plane. And oh, I, very good. And, I'm, and he's remained a, a hero of mine ever since. And that was a very happy time, 1982. God, you remember that, 82 yeah. January. But you were about 10 then, I think. <laughs> or 12, in or around that sort of age group, yeah. <laughs> how, how lovely to hear you. I like, though, though I like that uh, suggestion that if you Googled the word lady, that Joanna Lumley would come up as one of the uh, results. That was just a compliment. It wasn't true, though, was it? Yeah. Is that true, you Dave? Have know. you actually done that? No, but I, I think I can visualise an awful lot of people. Work. Ah, so you, 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 you're living in a, an imaginary world, Dave. <laughs> Don't we all, Jerry? <laughs> Have a good can weekend, I, Dave. Thank you. Can I say a quick hello to all the hard-working staff in Mortgage Companion and Santry? They're working extremely hard. Out Mortgage there. Companion? Mortgage Companion out in Santry. And are they actually doing anything at the moment, are they? Well, doing a little bit, but they do a bit more than mortgages. So uh, okay. anyone that wants to feel free to, to Google them and give us a ring. So this wasn't, in fact, um, uh, an opportunity to say hello to Joanna Lonely. Oh, most certainly This was, was. just, that, a, that just a, a gratuitous plug <laughs> for a mortgage company. Good <laughs> morning. Thanks, Jerry. Cheers. Bye, Dave. Ah, yes, they'll do anything, won't they? Um, how do people find you do they when 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 you have these um things like the thing whatever it is that you're going to do in cornell's court and duns at 12 30 which is in approximately one hour and 47 minutes um and with the the roads the way they are today you'll have to give yourself plenty of time to get there how do people are people nice to you yeah they're lovely because also i've done because apart from doing acting i've appeared on quite a lot of chat shows or i've done documentaries where i am me and if you think you're in somebody's sitting room at home in their television set, and they get used to your voice and um, they feel they know you. So, and in a funny way, all the programmes I do, like you, this is quite an oil slick kind of thing to say, is for the general public and for the people out there who we love. So when people who you love come up to you and say nice things, what could be nicer? So it doesn't trouble me a bit. I love it. And then going to do what's what we call a meet and greet. You know that? I love them. Yeah. That's what we're doing at Cornell's Court, at Dunn's. And so that's just going to be lovely. And it just means I get a chance to meet people because I'm crazy mad about Ireland, passionate about Dublin, and I have to leave today. And, I and to do, do, do people say, do Patsy? Do they? No, they don't. They don't. They used to. And I think they secretly all wanted to meet Patsy rather than me. Because as you can tell... <laughs> I'm quite a glum woman, but Patsy was no, quite no, good no. fun and you're she just, didn't give a damn. You're just much more polite. Oh, don't <laughs> say that. I'm, no, I can't. I'm, com I'm committing the crime. Oh, what? Sin. Do speak Patsy. Do speak a bit of Patsy. Well, if Patsy was here, she would have, well, she would have recognised your hangover, but she hasn't got a hangover. Mm, it's a permanent hangover. It's permanent hangover. It's a rotting way. She uh, always laughed like Elvis Presley. Yeah, and she had a sneer. Yeah, it was the Elvis, the Elvis sneer. She yeah. she she developed that. When you were creating Patsy, because you know, a writer can write, a director can direct. You can have a voice coach helping you. You can have somebody helping you develop the character. But really, at the end of the day, it's up to you to actually make the thing come alive, uh, despite what the director is telling everybody else. Um, how did you make Patsy? What were you thinking of? I wanted to make Jennifer. I didn't know Jennifer Saunders, so I was cast blind, as it were, and I met her. And she's she's a 
fabulously complicated woman and not very communicative. So I knew that really it, when we were doing sort of read, reading a scene of it when before we started filming, we were doing a scene where Patsy and Adina are sitting in a taxi. I didn't know what kind of a voice. I didn't know what to be, and she didn't really give me much help. But she'd written it, and uh, I, so I couldn't really work out how to do it. So all the way through it, because I was in the show, it was only a pilot, and I thought well, I've got to do it. I just tried to do things that might make her smile. I've got a face like a sphinx. Oh. And I did something somewhere that I could see just just a bit of a nostril twitch and a bit, little bit of a lip curl. So I went along that road of Patsy. And then that made her smile. And so I thought, that's the way I'm going to go. And I remembered somebody, a friend of mine, who walked with slightly hunched back. Because I think she'd had an operation on her piles. We're back to the hemorrhoids again. Hmm. That kind of show. That would um, make you hunch every time. And I thought that she would be a bit hunchy. And... Uh, and once I got that idea that she probably, the first thing she did every morning was reach out and drink down a glass of neat vodka. I <laughs> got that sort of seared <laughs> inside feeling. Then I felt I got her. Then as soon as I got her, Jennifer began to write exactly for her. So she kind of developed. And we developed a backstory where Pat's had been born, how she'd gone to school. She was in kindergarten age 12 because she'd never been educated. <laughs> <laughs> and you know her sort of fairly rackety life she lived like an alley cat but she was devoted to Adina because Adina had, A had the money what, yeah. what, and uh, had the place the place to live and was her best friend and now and you're probably fed up to the teeth of uh, some of these questions but um, there is a, g- a general belief that um, the two characters were based on two characters and uh, that of real extraction well, Adina, well, yeah. everybody thought that. Jennifer's much cleverer than that. I mean, she got an idea from Lynn Franks's office, which was a big purple well, I've sofa. I've interviewed Lynn Franks. Have you? Yeah. Well, the big purple sofa was what did it for Lynn, because then she thought, they've copied me exactly. But Patsy, didn't, Patsy was nowhere. I, I invented her out of old... I put her together from old rock chicks I'd met, or models, or me, or how things were, or just made her up, made her up. And so she, she, was, she was nobody. It's funny, isn't it, though, because... Jennifer writes it and I would have imagined and I don't think she's a selfish woman I mean I don't know her but I, I, I imagine she's not no. um, I would have, but I would have imagined that she perceived the dominant and central character as her character yes. then Patsy materialises and of course that which is meant to serve the other character becomes the main character well I think they now you're going to say something very yes, generous I, no I'm not, I'm not a generous person <laughs> I can see from the size of my mouth <laughs> Trouble inserting a spoon. Um, the truth is, is that she really was the dominant. It was her story. It, the, the general story of it was her and her daughter. That was the whole stress. Patsy was just a peripheral character. But I. Th- but became, but was I she- believe, the more interesting of the three. And that's not to... It's only downgrading them. It's not saying that they weren't incredibly attractive characters. They were. Mm. And you were really drawn to them for a whole host of wonderful reasons and good reasons mm. and powerful, creative reasons. Mm. But when Patsy appeared on the screen, you were going, yes, something <laughs> really mad's going to happen now. <laughs> and something unseemly. Yes. It was lovely, wasn't it? That, but that's Jennifer's generosity. And also... Yeah, maybe, Just the, you know, the, mm. the fun to have it. She said the, the Patsy, now they're doing it in America, Patsy's character has loomed up much, much bigger and has turned into a complete monster. Who's playing Patsy in America? I can't remember. A girl who's in... I don't know, three somethings from the sun. I don't know the programme. What's the programme? Three steps. Three. Six something from the... Look at them. Third Third rock rock from the sun. Third rock from the sun. I'm so on the ball here, Jerry. She is... She played a very amusing, aggressive, sexy, but sexually inept character in that and she was very funny well I think she's going to be very funny in this Jennifer said she's very very good she has a kind of there's a sort of cold caustic thing that she does and she does it very well and who's um, I don't know any of the other she didn't tell me she didn't tell me did you think the office worked American style didn't see it I couldn't bear to see it because I loved it so much Mm. the original version I I Redo- don't like remakes. Re- redoing remakes. I was, was listening to Jeremy Irons being interviewed some time ago on Ryan Tuberty, I think it was. That's right, Jeremy. <laughs> Good morning, Jeremy, if you're listening in the pink castle. <laughs> and we hovered two inches above the ground. Um, and he, he was fantastically, fantastically uber critical of Jude Law and the whole plan to make the, uh, uh, by being polite, <laughs> to make the remake of Brideshead Revisited. Yeah. 
And he said, well, he said, they, um, they're attempting to do in a short space of time what we took a very long time to do. And he just went, ooh. <laughs> and it, like, it just, it, it consigned the project, the film, to the scrap heap. Um, yet, on the other hand, I recall in this very seat being cruel and horrible and nasty and unpleasant towards Daniel Craig, mocking him for wearing a life jacket when he was on the Thames, promoting the uh, Casino Royale. And then I went to see Casino Royale and I was so mortified that he was so fantastic. Mm. And I looked at my boys, my two boys who'd come to it with me, and I said, what do you think? And they said, he's the best. Well, you see. <laughs> I know, but you see, Bond, Bond has to go on because there was never a Bond. I mean, he was only ever written in Ian Fleming's books. So he can be carried on. Steed can't be replaced because Steed was only ever John Steed. It was only ever Patrick McNee. Mm. Um, Pride and Prejudice can be remade as it is virtually every year with a new cast because it was a book and it will go on no matter and what And there'll happens. always be some Colin Firth for some generation for who sure. can do it. And somebody who's handsome yeah. and gorgeous and just right because then by the time they people think, oh, I Batman like it. can be done again and again. Again and again. But some things can't. Some things which were just it. The Sweeney, for instance, was... Oh, I do you remember the they've remade The Sweeney? Now, That's why? That's not a plan. What would be better would be to show the old Sweeney's, I think. We sound like old codgers who think that yeah. nothing is We're grumpy good people. unless it's old. I know. Um, Brideshead is the perfect example, though, and it is because of the magnificent, beautiful, wonderful cinematography, the direction, the script, the narration is just... Jeremy Irons, as far as I was concerned, was at kind of God level seven when he was doing that. Poor old Anthony, who had a rather difficult time afterwards, was also pretty much up there as yeah. well. And you just can't replicate that chemistry. I know, and Castle Howard was some, somehow the most magical place. Who that played the mother? Who was the mother? Um, Isn't it awful? I've forgotten. Mm, 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 mm. I know Olivier played the father. Ah, I yes, the dying of course. Scene. Correct, indeed. You young people will want to enjoy yourselves. <laughs> it's just, oh, that it was, was wonderful. Venice. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, I have to be very careful when I'm watching it. It makes me want to go to Venice, which is not always technically possible at half ten at night. Or it makes me drink. <laughs> well, let's be honest. Nearly everything does that. 2FM.
And as part of my humble programme today, Joanna Lumley has um, deigned to join us. Um, she is doing some work with Nivea Visage Expert. If she's doing it for free she, because she just thinks it's so good. Um, and she's an innocent. She doesn't know why it's so good, but she just thinks it is. And she'll be in Cornell's court at 12.30, um, signing things and, and just being, yes. really, isn't that it? Um, so if you want to come along and chat to her. Now, um, finally, in the last few dying embers of this fire, um, you have an extraordinary background. Your childhood, where did you grow up? I was born in India. I was born in Kashmir, just the like year... Like Cliff before. Richard. Yes, like Cliff. Cliff was born further down south in India, yeah. and I was right up in the north in the Himalayas. Um, and the partition of India came the year after I was born. So I left when I was one. That was good for Indian restaurants, but I think bad for the subcontinent. However. Bad for the subcontinent, mm. the speed that it was done. But mm. we won't talk about that now and today. Mm. Um, so I then went to Hong Kong with my father's regiment, which was the Gurkha regiments. He served the Gurkhas all his life. And then they were posted to what were called, it was called the emergency in Malaya. They were pretty fearsome on the battlefield. What were they like socially? Tip top. Darling men. Very, very, very funny. Mm. Very brave. Very um, modest. And completely lethal. So they are adored and admired around the world. Yes, they'd eat you if they ran out of bullets. They would not eat you, no. Rest Sorry, I made that up. <laughs> um, but it sounded good for just a nanosecond. So, off to Hong Kong with you. Then we went to Malaya, which I sort of treated as my home because I was there from about five till the age of eight and went to school there and loved it. Thought thought the world always, the sun went down at six and came up at six in the morning, that it was always 120 degrees in the shade. And I thought that's how the world was. And then came, oh, and all, between all these, we went on big troop ships from India back to Southampton, out to Hong Kong, back to Singapore, back to Southampton, on troop ships, which were pretty tinny old ships. Um, no pleasure, no recreation, no nothing, no nice things on it. But you get used to it, leaning on the, on the rail of the ship every day, just hissing across the Indian Ocean, uh, eating an orange every day to keep away the scurvy. And then you could smell land before it arrived. You could smell Port Said before you could see it. And then get there and the, the boats would come up with what were called gully gully men, all going gully 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 and they'd have stuff to sell and they'd pull it up on ropes or put little ladders up. And they'd come up and do conjuring tricks with live chickens and... Conjuring yeah, tricks with live chickens? on the deck. As children we'd watch that. And then gradually, gradually through, through the sailing through the, um, the extraordinary Suez Canal where it just was desert meeting the ship on both sides, through to the Mediterranean, Malta, Gibraltar, back home, chopping across the Bay of Biscay, and Southampton, just grey and dreadful and raining. I thought my life had ended. I thought it was the end of the world. But anyway, then I just got used to being in England and loved it. But I've always loved travelling, and because an army life was packing and leaving every two or three years, I sort of got that gypsy feeling, as my parents had also been, you know, they would go about India, India forever. So you never really belonged anywhere, which I like. Sort of nomadic existence. So where are you from then? In your heart, where, what's, when, what instantly do you reply, even if it's only privately to yourself? Are you from Malaya? Are you no, from India? No, my yeah. dreams sometimes are of Malaya. My, my real, some dreams are right of, I went to Syria for the first time when I was completely grown up and I felt absolutely at home in Syria. So maybe Syria, <laughs> it's <laughs> mad, but I loved it there. Maybe, I don't know, I just like everywhere I am. Home is obviously where you, I love London. When I came to London when I was 18, I thought I would love to live in this city and I'd love this city to adopt me because I'd been born abroad and my father had been born in Lahore and so on, all of going back. I had to apply for British citizenship, so I had to pay for it to become a British citizen. So I have a feeling that I've bought my way into British society, which is great, proud of it, proud to be a Londoner, proud, proud to pay the congestion charge. <laughs> I was 18 and the first place I lived outside of this country was London, Notting Hill Gate. Yeah. 17, Arundel Gardens. I know that. What a fantastic house, I remember as well. Yes, you wouldn't get your foot inside it nowadays. No, you wouldn't. And um, it was only myself and two or three other Irish white people and about 50 million, um, I think mostly Jamaicans. Um, they, 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 they gave us a run for our money, I can tell you. Did they? <laughs> there was a lot of growing up. And I thought that I was a very sophisticated young fellow from Ireland. I remember walking into a pub and saying, I'll have... Uh, Jemison whiskey, please, and a pint of lager for my pal here. And he said, right, Paddy. And I went, shit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. 
Yeah, well, we were blowing up England at the time, so I suppose he was uh, justified in some way. It's been an absolute pleasure having you you with us this morning. Um, I do hope that you enjoy Don's today, and I hope they enjoy you. Thank you. And this Nivea stuff, I'm going to rub it all over me later on, okay? I just hope you do, but before you do that, may I come around the desk and give you a lick? You can certainly (laughs) do that if you wish. Um, It'll prepare you for what's ahead of you later today. (laughs) Good You're morning. a star, Jerry. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. To